Wow. Okay, okay. I was so excited about worship, I was ready to do this even before the introduction. And sitting here in worship and looking back and just kind of watching you guys, it's one of the best uh, places to be. Um, I know we've he heard a lot of this Ford Amphitheater stuff going on this weekend, but that nothing beats what just took place in here for worship. Um, all right. So as we wrapped up our mixtape metaphor series, um, I cannot compete at all with what we saw from Levon a few weeks ago with the boom box and the gold chain. But I was looking for my mixtape from my bride from 30 years ago, and look what I found. I found, uh, I found my cassettes. I've got the Eagles. I've got Billy Joel. I've got Boston Journey. Um, little Van Halen. I don't have Guns N' Roses, um, and I don't have any gospel. Sorry. Um, I do have the original Top Gun. Um, I probably got this one for my mom. Hi, mom. Uh, this is White Heart, because when you have, your, when you have your, your rock collection, you also need a little Christian rock in there, too. So anyway, I, I couldn't compete with the gold chain and the boom box, and I also don't have a tape player, so I couldn't listen to those anyway. Um, <clears throat> But if I wanted to, I can go see LeVon, because he's got one. Um, all right, so as, we, uh, as I was preparing to wrap up our series, I kind of looked back a little bit on some of the um, I Am statements from the summer. We had some really good ones. We had Pastor Josh Starnes. I think I saw you in here. I don't know if you still are, but he, um, he unpacked I Am the Good Shepherd, and he was kind of encouraging us and reminding us to, to follow somebody that matters, not just somebody with a blue check mark. Um, LeVon, I am the way and the truth and the life. And after I got past his gold chains in his boom box, that was really good. And then a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Patrick, uh, he unpacked I am the vine for us. If you didn't see that, you're going to need to go back and see that um, because you need to determine if you're a dipper or not. And I'm just going to leave that right there. <laughs> Uh, you guys can go figure that one out on your own, but that one was phenomenal, and it's definitely worth your time. So as this summer wraps up, I hope we were able to dig in a little bit more and understand a little bit more of the heart of Jesus through our I Am statements. But today, uh, I want us to consider a much more personal question uh, found in the four Gospels. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke, uh, and I think it's one of the most compelling questions that Jesus asked His disciples. That question is, who do you say I am? So before I jump in, let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Father, for this time that you've blessed us with. Lord, I thank you for already showing up. Uh, thank you for your presence uh, during our time of worship. And Lord, I just simply ask, Father, that uh, I would step out of the way and that you would step in and that your voice would be loud and clear. And I pray, Father, that you'd be honored in this time. And I pray the things that are shared today would be useful to you in our hearts, in our lives, and that we can apply those things as we move forward. So we love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so back in June, um, we were at our Alpha class, and Pastor Travis, thank you for organizing that. Uh, you know, I kind of you actually registered us because we kept dragging our feet. So thank you for doing that. But I was listening to my daughter, Addie, uh, share a little bit with the group about her senior year. And her senior year was a pretty tough year. Um, and it was fascinating for her to share with our group. And she said something that kind of made me pause. And I want to, I want to, kind of paraphrase it. I think I got this right, Addy. You can jump up here and correct me if I'm wrong. But she said, your parents' faith isn't going to get you through tough times. It's not until you put the work in. It's not until you study the Bible that your faith becomes your own. Is that pretty close? It's pretty close. I found her comment uh, really um, interesting, and I loved it. Because when you really start to search, when you really start asking those hard questions, when you start digging in on your own, that's when you're able to answer the question, who do you say that I am? This comment from Addie, it made me realize 
or it, made me, it reminded me of the same question that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? So let's look at slide, our next slide, Matthew 16. This is, our, this is where we're going to land this, uh, this morning. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So as I was digging into this a little bit, I mean, I was asking myself, why do I think Jesus asked the question, who do people say the Son of Man is? I mean, didn't the disciples know who Jesus already was? I mean, they'd already been walking with him. They've already seen miracles. Uh, I'm pretty confident Jesus wasn't looking for compliments. Um, He definitely didn't ask the question because he was prideful. We certainly know that that's not in his character. Uh, He's all-knowing, so he knew um, what their answers were going to be. So why did he ask? Why did he ask the question? I would argue it's because he wanted them to consider their level of faith. And then when they gave an account of what others would say without adding their own personal conviction, he asked again. He wanted to hear what they thought. He wanted to understand where they were in their faith. So let's play this out today. It could be similar um, of, of what we say about Jesus when people ask us. Do we give a passionate, confident answer? Uh, Is there conviction, uh, or is it just kind of a safe answer? Don't want to ruffle any feathers, don't want to have a a debate about this, Uh, so we just give an easy answer. But if we're sharing about Jesus, or if we're not sharing about Jesus, how how are other people going to find out? Well, I would argue you could find out on the internet. You could do a quick Google search, and what people learn about Jesus if they do a quick Google search is interesting. Uh, and it's something that we can find out. So I actually did a quick Google search, and this information's good. Uh, Jesus Christ, also known as, the, as Jesus of Nazareth, is a central figure in Christianity. It's good. He's a central figure in Christianity. But it really lacks emotion. Um, this, is a, this is really a definition. This is a definition of Christianity or a religion. It's really not about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about, a, it's not a, a, a definition of somebody who is passionately pursuing you and loves you. So after Jesus asks his first question, he asks again, and he asks a more pointed question, but what about you? He asks, who do you say that I am? Now, this is where it's getting a little more personal, and this is where I want to focus our time this morning. Who do you say Jesus is? I would expect that our answers would be different. If we asked everybody in here today, I would expect that our answers would be different because of our relationship with Jesus, our time walking with Jesus, our circumstances that we find ourselves in. They would probably be different. Uh, But here are a few questions we might want to consider as we're kind of pondering this question. Have you made your faith your own? Similar to Addie and what she shared in our Alpha meeting, this helps shape who he is in your life and the trust that we place in him. Have you experienced his love? This certainly makes Christianity more about a relationship than it does a religion. And then have you learned to serve? You learn to serve like Jesus. I think this is huge. This helps us to live like Jesus, and it keeps us focused on other people as opposed to ourselves. So we have a choice. We can agree with Peter that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, or we can follow along with the world who makes Jesus out to, you know, just be a central figure in Christianity. So here we go. Three things that I want us to consider for how we could answer the question, who do you say Jesus is, if you are asked? Now, these are three things that I would give an answer to kind of a primer, if you will, for you guys to be thinking about what you would say, um, because I'm assuming that you guys have a lot of answers for yourself as well. But who do you say he is? Um, I would say he's creator. John 1, 3 through 4. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
Kind of sounds a little bit familiar with what we talked about this summer. Uh, I am the bread of life. We talked about that. I am the light of the world. Jeff, I think that was you. I am the light of the world. Uh, this question was brought up to me a few times over the last couple of weeks. It's kind of fun how when you're preparing for something, the Lord kind of prompts you on a few things. So this question was brought up to me a few times uh, over the last couple of weeks. How do you see God when I need to see something tangible to truly believe? I thought the word see was a pretty interesting word to consider. And I shared that I believe it's different for all of us. I believe it's different for all of us. But for me, I see God in His creativity um, when, I'm in, when I'm in the mountains or when I'm looking at the mountains. It is right there. Uh, if, if I would think Ann and Addie could probably attest, I'm probably standing in my house looking out the windows more than anything because I just am fascinated by the beauty of the mountains. I mean, they turn colors with the seasons. Uh, the sunsets in the background can certainly make you pause. I've, if you look at my pictures in my phone, I got so many sunset pictures because it's just God showing off every day. Uh, the mountains are blanketed in snow in the wintertime. Uh, Ann and I love to hike, and if you actually get into the mountains, then it's even more fascinating. The wildlife that you see that God created for us, um, hopefully you just see them and you're not running from them, but that's amazing. I love to fish, and I can watch the streams, and I see the fish, and they call it fishing, not catching for a reason, because I don't catch, but I love to try. Um, <laughs> It, I could just go on and on, the sounds of the streams, the smell of the evergreens. I see Jesus in his creativity as creator, but that's just me. That's just me, and I'm sure that other people can see him in other ways. But here is something that I want us to make sure that we all can see his creativity, and it's in Hebrews 4.12, if we've got that slide. For the word of God is active, or is alive and active. Some translations say it's living and powerful. The term active means effective, powerful. I love this, capable of producing an intended result. The Bible is so much more than a history book, so much more. And if you don't open the pages, you're not going to find out. And I have seen scripture come to life and to become alive and active in one season and then I can read Scripture, and it becomes alive and inactive for something fair, very different in another season. <clears throat> and I don't want to just say that this happens for me, because there may be some people that are going, oh, it's never happened for me. What do you mean? How does it become alive and active in different ways? So I want to share a little bit about, I'm going to give you actually an example of what that looks like, a um, real-life example. Uh, my stepfather passed away suddenly back in March of 2008. And a couple of months after that, I was able to get away, kind of reflect a little bit, uh, grieve the loss of him. And I do that by getting in the mountains. I grab my backpack, I grab my Bible, and I just went for a hike. Because when I'm away, and I get away with the Lord, and there's no distractions, I turn off technology, all the stuff that takes my time. I don't have a to-do list, whether it's a mental to-do list or whether Ann might give me a to-do list, I can just be uh, and have quality time with God. So this is what I wrote um, in May. I put all my eyeballs here. Uh, I was actually going to make a screenshot of my writing here in my Bible, but um, you probably couldn't have re read it because I'm hoping I can because my writing's horrible. So here's what I wrote on May the 6th, 2008. On top of a rock in Cheyenne Canyon, I took the day off to get away and grieve the loss of my stepdad. He emphasized 1 Timothy 2.15 throughout my childhood. Therefore, I thought I'd read the book of 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8 was what I called a God wink. Another moment in the journey that God showed up. Father God, thank you for showing up today. You are good all the time. So... What does 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8 say? Well, it says this. It says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now, the context for this letter, it was written by Paul, 
he was writing it to Timothy. Uh, Paul was Timothy's mentor. Uh, Paul, was in, uh, Paul was in prison, kind of his, you know, coming to the end of his life, and he was writing this letter uh, to Timothy. Now, obviously, this time of my reflection had nothing to do with Paul writing this letter to Timothy. But as I read it, I couldn't reflect um, but to think back on the life of my stepfather. I mean, it was very, very encouraging to me because I was sitting there thinking, um, my stepfather, you know, his, his, he had poured out his life to others. You know, he had departed. He had fought the good fight. He had finished the race. So there were things that I was reading in this verse that the Lord was saying, as I was looking for closure, he just came to life in this scripture. But then it's really interesting because I'm going to read what I wrote on March 15th. Same scripture, alive and active. March 15th, this is March 15th of 2012. So this is four years later. I took another day to do my hike and reflect, this time with tears as I leave Colorado. We, we'd lived here before, moved to Texas, and then we, we came back about seven years ago. Uh, this time with tears in my eyes as I leave Colorado and this special place. One last time to reflect, but today's reading was more about me leaving another God wink in this journey. I love you, Lord. So, I'm leaving this time. We were moving. We were going to, uh, we, we did, we went and worked at a church in Texas, and I'm sitting in this, in this moment on this rock in Cheyenne Canyon. For, I've been poured out like a drink offering. I was working at another ministry here in town. It really felt like I had done what the Lord had called me to do there. The time has come for my departure. I have fought the, the good fight. I finished the race here, and we were leaving. Again, Scripture coming alive, and it, it was active. Um, I was going to skip this one, but I'm actually going to share this one too. Same scripture. Now, this was December 31st, uh, 2017, another five years later. And here are my notes. These are really small, so I hope I can read this. It says, uh, I wrote these scriptures, exclamation point, today, December 31st, 2017. I read them with the knowledge of my departure from the church that I'd served at. I was poured out. I finished the race. Now I wait, and see, I told you I have my handwriting horrible. Now I wait, and I seek the crown, the award, praying, Lord, for your favor and your blessings on my journey. Alive and active. But I wouldn't see that if I didn't open up the word and pour into it. Um, all right, so this one was fun, too. So this is just a little bit of an exclamation point um, on this little section. So I started to put some thoughts together a week or so ago on this. And really started navigating this, uh, just um, put words on paper just a couple of days ago. And this was really interesting. I don't know if you guys use the, ba the Bible app. Uh, you get the daily verse, you do reading plans and all that stuff. <clears throat> so if you could put that up, this was the Bible app. This was Thursday. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Is God not alive and active? Um, so anyway... Um, point number two that I would love to make. Who do you say that I am? I said creator, point number two. I, I think he's compassionate. If we read about the life of Jesus, we can easily say he's compassionate. Compassion means suffering with, not just feeling sorry for somebody, but suffering with. And we see examples of his compassion uh, throughout the life uh, of Jesus. One example that we discussed this summer uh, was the uh, I am statement, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus was at the grave of Lazarus. He saw Lazarus' friends weeping, and he wept alongside them. John 11.33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping, her being Mary, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. He wasn't just moved, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, Matthew 14, Scripture tells us, when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion. He had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. The story of Jesus healing the man with leprosy in Mark 1, Scripture says, now a leper came to him, and I love the picture that is painted here, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And the ultimate display of compassion, and I, th I think we can all recognize, is what the Lord did on the cross for us. This is not just a central figure in Christianity, like, like Google says. 
This is someone who loves us and gave his life for us. So Jesus is certainly compassionate. And I hope you know that the compassion he had for people walking through trials during his time on earth, that's the same compassion that he has for you while you're walking through trials today. Okay, point number three. We said creator, compassionate uh, community. Now you're going to have to bear with me here. This is where I got a little bit creative because um, I don't do this all the time and um, I, you know, following our lead pastor's you know, lead, I, I kind of think that you typically do maybe three or four points. I don't know if you always try to you know, have them start with the same letter. I think that's kind of cool when you do that too, when you're kind of teaching. Um, so I got creator, compassionate, and community. But community is not really where I started. Uh, I started with companion. And then as I started with companion, it kind of rolled into community. And then as I kind of hit community, it kind of rolled into church. So we kind of got a three for one here on this um, instead of just one solid point. But hopefully uh, you guys can just kind of roll with me. Maybe it's just a big compound word. Maybe that's what I should have put on there. But anyway, seriously, community within the church I think is huge. Jesus being the ultimate creator, he could have created anything for us to experience community. Anything. Anything. And he created the church, not only for believers, but for those seeking and looking to fill a void in their lives. Is the church perfect? It's not. It's not, because guess what? It's filled with imperfect people. But just like he forgives us and he shows us grace, we should do the same thing with the imperfect people that we're surrounded by in church. So Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says this, let us not consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. <clears throat> so much in this verse. Within the community of the church, we should look to encourage each other uh, to grow closer to God. Sometimes I think we approach church with this consumeristic attitude. Uh, what can we get from the church? Uh, but instead, I would encourage us to think about how can we help? How can we help stir up others uh, in love and good deeds? All right, Pastor Patrick didn't ask me to do this, so I hope it's okay. If not, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> I think if we give an enthusiastic, real answer for who you say Jesus is, um, I'm going to encourage you to get involved in the life of this church. If you really want to give an enthusiastic, enthusiastic answer, no better way to start engaging with in Timber Creek. <clears throat> and I think this is important, not because the church needs you to serve, because we have openings that need to be filled, but because you have needs for a community that only the church can fill. So as I shared with a minute ago, I reluctantly signed up for our Alpha class. Re reluctantly. <laughs> you kind of had to chase me down. I, I saw the promotional videos that we played up here, and I saw a lot of the younger guys and girls, and I'm like going, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of going, yeah, I think this is maybe for the younger people. Everybody's starting to look younger to me. Um, and, then I, and then I jumped online. I thought, I bet some of these videos are available online. So I got online, and all of them are online. So I watched the first two, and I thought, you know, this really feels like it's something for someone who wants to learn a little bit more about Jesus, maybe learn a little bit more about their faith. Um, I, Travis, I even told myself, seating's limited at the collective. Why would I want to fill up some spots? Maybe some other people can do this. Again, it's, it's not for me. I'm going to pass. Um, Addie was also nudging us to do this. So we did. And I found a community of people of all ages that I enjoyed getting to know. Uh, through this community, I witnessed people spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. So if you haven't found community here, start asking questions. If you want to learn something about men's ministry, there's Cleve. He just did a men's retreat this summer for the first time. So way to go, Cleve. I mean, if you want to learn about women's ministry, visit with Lanitha, and actually there's going to be a lot more shared. We just saw the promotion on, on Vision Sunday. There's going to be more shared there. 
if you want to know or serve with kids of any age, <laughs> bless you, um, ask Pastor Josh Starnes. If you want to join the prayer team, ask me. Um, if you want to serve in other capacities, stop by Next Steps. Again, not because the church needs you to fill a hole that we might have, but you need the community that, community that only the church can fill. All right, I'm going to wrap up here. The question that we started with was, who do you say that I am? I gave three responses, all starting with the letter C, kind of proud of that. Um, creator, compassionate, well, maybe five responses, companion, community church thing. Uh, but there are many more answers that I think uh, we could give, and I want to end with this video that might help us see um, how that could play out. I wonder, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. That's my king. I'm telling you that that video gets me every time. I've watched that video for years, and it gets me every time. And for me, I shared those three or five words because today that's where I am. But in a week or two, those words might be different for me, and I'm sure they're different for you right now. And whatever word you came up with describe, to describe who Jesus is to you, it, it could change next week depending upon what your circumstances are. But I do hope that all of us at some point can call Him Savior. And if you're not calling Him that today, what are you waiting on? 
What are you waiting on? All right, so we're going to pray here. We do this every, nearly every week. And I hope this never becomes routine. Because if you're answering the questions that I'm going to ask here in a second, it's one of the most important times of your life. And as Patrick always says, these aren't magic words, um, but they're very important. So I would ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. It's just a, just a private moment between you and the Lord. And I would say that in a group this size, I know we've got people who've been walking with Jesus for a long time. I'm one of those. But some of you may have a season, and it could be now that you've taken a kind of a pause, maybe. Jesus is kind of taking a back seat. And you realize today that you're missing those times where you want to have a, just a deeper engagement, that you want to see Jesus alive and active in your life. And I'll be honest, I can relate to that. Because I've been in that season recently. So if that is you, I would ask you to raise your hand so I can pray for you on re-engaging with Jesus. Thanks. It's pretty cool to see hands raised. I also know that there may be a few people in a group of this size, not as many, but a few people that have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And as we've unpacked who He is and what He could be in your life, today is a really, really good day to ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. So if that's you, I would also like you to raise your hand so we can pray together about that decision. Thank you. All right, so let's pray together about these two opportunities. Lord, I thank you, Father, for those that raise their hand to say, I want to re-engage with you. I'm kind of tired of doing this thing on my own, and I have walked away from you, and I've recognized that it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, so I'm inviting you back into my life. And I pray, Father, that there would just be a, a sense of peace and comfort as we re-engage. And Lord, I also pray for those who are longing to walk away from this rat race and trying to do this thing on my own and searching and seeking for something. And sometimes it's an unknown. But Lord, we know, we know what you can do. We know who you are. So if you are someone who raised your hand and said, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I just would ask you to simply pray this prayer. Prayer. Lord, I admit that I've made mistakes and I've sinned against you. I believe that Jesus died and that you rose again to pay for my sins. And today, I simply confess that I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. So, Lord, we thank you, Father, for meeting us today. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for the time of worship and for the time of receiving today. We pray, Lord, that you were glorified today in our efforts and our praise to you. And, uh, Lord, we simply love you and we say that you are our King. Amen.